Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Kasloff, and welcome to the Something Something Podcast. And the other voice you're going to be hearing is Larry Sands. How's it going, Larry? Oh, it is a sweltering hot day. Other than that, I'm doing fabulous. How are you? It's going good, man. It's about 78 today here in Jersey, but it's kind of nice out. Um, it's The weather's been getting better. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Hey, man. So uh, I know you've been working on a couple of things and oh, I yeah. wanted to talk to you because you you're shooting stuff for your church, right? Yeah, we're about to begin this Sunday school ministry and there's going to be puppets involved. So kind of like Sesame Street and I'm going to be writing like some of the storyline stuff out about the puppets. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Yet another thing to throw into the, the stuff mix. that we're working <laughs> on. Um, I'm up to the final battle in Hillsborough Road. Okay. Then Good. there's the epilogue, which okay. was my favorite stuff to film. Right, right, right. And then it goes off to you for Sound the lights, and the lights effects. special effects, and yeah. maybe trimming like a couple seconds here or here there. there. Yeah. Yeah. For, for timing and pace. And then yeah. um, everything's going good with our audio book. We're still working yeah. with that. It's going to be pretty amazing. Actually listen to our narrators and then getting to go back through and adding some sound effects and little ambient music. It's great. Yeah, it's like we have so much going on. Oh, and wait. The other, I was oh, about oh. to say it. Yes. We yes. are about to hit 200 episodes of the something something podcast Unbelievable. it might be more because we officially count when we got on to the major podcasting oh, yeah. apps as the show starting but man it's gonna be a, a special episode is gonna have some excuse me audio stuff sent in from our friends but yeah. Mainly me and you reminiscing about look back. <laughs> yeah, everything that's come from the show. But Man. Larry, one of my biggest passions, as you know, is writing. Right. Screenwriting in particular. My new script is done. Again, I just have to add a joke to something. Yeah. But other than that, it's done. It's, but I also love reading. We had a great writer on yesterday. Yeah. Um, and you know, I just love reading. And our guest today is a pretty accomplished writer. Why don't you tell everybody about her? Yes, actually. Um, our our guest for this episode is an award winner. Her yes. name is Kay Oliver. She's done <laughs> I'll I'll introduce her, but uh, but Kay, welcome to the show. Thank you for being on. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. You're welcome. And I started to giggle to myself because I wanted to introduce you as you've had a lot of stuff that that you've done in Hollywood. And I believe you're still doing in Hollywood. But then you're you've taken on your your passion of writing books and novels. Correct. Right. And on the money and and wanted to to kind of. Talk about because your road to Elysium is that right? Correct. Yes, that is from what I see and have read in your bio. That is a first place award winner. Three times. Uh -huh. Three times. Oh, not once. Yeah, not twice, but three times. Which one time is is a feat unto itself. Three times is pretty special. Mm -hmm. So congratulations. Thank you. You're, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, tell us because it it on the surface it says it's in, inspired by a true story. Correct. So uh, tell us a little bit about Road to Elysium. Road to Elysium is a book that touches base on a lot of topics we face here in America. Um, it was inspired by a true story of a young man who walked up to another man and asked him to teach him a sport. It was one of those, at the end of a newscast, uplift stories. I went in to research it, found nothing on it, and I thought, this can't, this can't not be said somehow. 
Hmm. So uh, it is a book about the boldness of a young man and the knee-jerk reaction from the adult who says he will teach him and how it changes his life, the boy's life, the community's life, and uh, his whole uh, situation because he, he, the lead character, the, the, old, the older guy, um, went through some tragedy of his own and was depressed at the time that he made this, hmm. oh, why not? decision that changed everything wow wow that that kind of i mean it's such a it, i mean you know just from that i get the feeling that um out of tragedy comes so much i hate to say it but no but you're right it almost it's so much good stuff if you can survive the tragedy that's a whole it's 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 weird saying it and it's probably even weirder hearing it come out but i think that out of the horrible stuff that goes in in that comes in and out of our lives as as just people you know yeah i really, think when you're in when you're in the tragedy it's harder to feel what you're saying, right? Yeah. That there's going to be something good come out of this. Yeah. We get to the other side and we all get to the other side. If we make good choices, um, we look back and go, wow, that changed this, this, and this, and probably for the better. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's really good. That's really good. Great. Uh, very well said. Um, how did you come up with the idea of this book? Well, the fact that that story needed to get out there, be it minds of fiction and is not really uh, having spoken to the individuals that it actually happened to, but um, there was so much there. You know, like I said, the boldness of Michael, the young boy, the boldness of or Ken's knee-jerk reaction, um, all because he was wondering about something that happened at his house and he started wondering and thinking and that sent him off on a journey he never expected and it changes you know the way he perceives life why you know why just a few miles away from his house are there children living the way you know that these children are living when his area yeah. you know, his children wouldn't be you know trying to rob houses and stuff so right. not that you know, there's no racial indication there but it's just, you know, you can live in the same neighborhood and not know someone, you know, five blocks away who's suffering. Right. So yeah. um, not, not Michael wasn't really suffering, but another young boy in the book was, which drove him over to meet Michael. Wow. Wow. How did you hear about the story to even contemplate writing a book? It was a blurb at the end of the news, an uplifting story at the end of the news. And wow. I immediately got on the computer and went to look it up and I found one little paragraph. I searched and searched and that was it. And I said, no, we need more. Wow. So, so really you were watching the news and this took hold, this, this story took hold and it just started this, gosh, this down this path, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah, the right. storyteller at heart. Yes. Absolutely. Right. Right. True creative. Wow. That just goes to show you that, that, um, uh oh god bless america uh your passion and anything around you could be used for for your passion really yes absolutely wow um uh what how long did it take you to write this book probably about four months wow how many That's pages awesome. is this? Oh, uh, 200. Uh, I don't see. Let's see. Oh, man. <laughs> 300. That was close, right? 329 pages. Jeez. In four months? I'm an avid writer. <laughs> yeah, wow. it sounds like it. Um, yeah, I have a book in editing right now, and I'm on the fifth chapter of the book that's going to follow that one. So I just don't stop. I'm just a machine. So wow. with me, I'm a really big outliner when it comes to stuff. Um, are you an outliner or do you, or you're a pantser as it's called? I believe, well, I write fast to begin with, regardless of what I'm writing. Um, and I just write, I just write, and I, this is, you know, when people ask me for a tip, I say, sit down, start writing, 
I'm a Virgo. I like to correct everything. You can't just keep writing. Just keep the momentum going. Keep writing. And I do write out some things. Um, uh, one of my books, I had to write out two family trees and everything. So I knew where people were within the book. But for the most part, I just write the idea and just keep going and keep going. Wow. And, uh, wow. Same, same was true with my first book. So, which came from a question in my head. So, you, you know, the book ideas come from anywhere. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Much. And, and I think that really goes for anything, whether it's a book idea, actors, it's a little bit more difficult, but, but really like filmmakers, writers and authors and even, you know, musicians, Anything that surrounds them, I think, is kind of open game if they let that come into their creative space, I think. Right. Yeah, I call them creatives. Yeah. I, mean, instead, well, I don't know people say talent, but I say, uh, you know, having worked in Hollywood, I call them creators. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. And and this is your how many books do you have? I have five out, one in edit, and I'm writing another one. So it'll wow. be seven. Wow. So this is your this is your fifth one, right? Yes. And and it's brand new. Um, well, first of all, I would be where can you get it? You can get it at Amazon.com. Okay. And or my website, which is uh my name with an A in the middle. So K A Y A Oliver O L I V E R dot com. Okay, links perfect. will be in the description of when we post this. And yes. also we will link everything in our social media. Perfect. Um as as a writer and coming from Hollywood, um, and again, actually before we started to to record our show, um, before we started, I did mention that, you know, your your publicist sent over um <laughs> <laughs> a bio and and it had Steven Spielberg and yeah. Savan Entertainment in the same in the same sentence and really got intrigued. Our minds were blown. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about your time in in Hollywood, what you've done, and even now you're part of the Academy, Television Academy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, uh, I started in Hollywood. I was blessed to work for uh, Lou Wasserman, who owned and ran Universal Studios. So what? I, yeah. I yeah. There. Wait, you, wait, wait. You knew you worked? You actually knew Lou Wasserman? Yes, I actually would That's, talk to him. Oh, my awesome. God. Yes, he was a joy. He was a joy. I, I enjoyed him a lot. Wow. Yeah. That just yeah. blows my mind. That so, he's, wow. But, no, no, I'm, I could just ramble. Go ahead. That's amazing to me, Kay. Wow. Well, you can write confession if you can just ramble. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, from there, you can see the easy link to uh, going over to DreamWorks and Steven Spielberg because, you know, Steven's on the lot. Um, Amblin's on the Universal lot. So I've, I've seen Steven many times before I started working over there. And then um, I tried to get out of Hollywood. <laughs> Uh, and one of my friends at Saban called me up and said, come over here for a little while. So I went over there. Um, I, growing up, never watched Power Rangers, but I now know everything about them. <laughs> so uh, did the first graphic novels for the show. Wow. So that got me back into, you know, I need to go, I need to write for myself. The wow. difference in Hollywood or that creative is you've got a lot of creatives with you, right? You just don't yeah. do your own thing. Well, when you sit down with the book, you're writing the whole thing. It's, it's all you. you. Yeah. You're, you're putting yourself into it. It's your voice, you know, other than the editor making corrections or say, you know, leave it up here. But for the most part, it's you from the start to the end. And so uh, that's why I really enjoy taking a story either on film, which is what I you know did for a living, or in a book. The, the only difference is there's no visual. So in a book, yeah. you write a little more because you have to say what's sitting on the desk. They can't see it like in the right. film. Yeah. So, you know, and so much is told in a film by what's on a desk, what's not on a desk, what kind mm -hmm. of desk. Yeah. All that tells you about the character who owns that desk. Yeah. Um, you, you know, if you realize it or not. And uh, in a book, you have to fill that in. So, so kind of yeah. stuff. 
when you were working, you know, with DreamWorks and Universal, what were you doing exactly? I wasn't working there. I was either at Warner Brothers. Oh, you know what I meant. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> what were you doing exactly? Oh, um, I did a lot of marketing on the consumer end of it. Wow. Um, I When I worked at DreamWorks, I did, uh, they had their own film festival. So I did write, produce, and direct a couple of films um, for that. And uh, yeah, my hobby was short films at the time for yeah, just, just the That's enjoyment amazing. of making your own story. And I was an editor to start off with. I started in the business as an editor. Wow. And um, it's so different now because you can do it on your phone. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. What did you start and, off editing? What is this when the uh... cut and paste and tape <laughs> and for real? Wow. For real. When things actually landed on the floor. Wow. Yeah. wow. That, if you were using film, it still landed on the floor. Yeah. Okay, everybody, let's just let's just take this in for one moment because and and it is, Kay, you're absolutely right. When you make it look easy and every you see the end result, right, all the time. Yeah. But when people start to get into it, they go, Man, this is so time consuming. And I'm like, Yeah, but yeah. but cutting actual cutting a film and putting it together that is That's true art. amazing <laughs> it's it's hard for i think a lot of people to know what the editing a movie was like before avid i mean i'm right. a premiere user yeah. but the the thing that you know lawrence of arabia was oh. cut and paste and then even some other Jaws. stuff in the 90s everything you know? it's it's crazy yeah it's, it's not all done in a dark little room and you'd look up at the clock, and if it wasn't a digital clock, you wouldn't know if it's 4 a.m. Oh. or 4 p.m. because it took that long. Yeah, <laughs> I believe it. I believe That's... it. Wow. Kay, okay, first of all, we got to have you back on and just talk about talk editing. Talk about that, because, yeah. Because I have a feeling nobody really realizes, unless you actually grew up, like, getting into it right before the computers took over, and and you started doing stuff on the computer where you actually had a cutting. You, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I, I need a paper bag. See, the edit droid was just coming out with with George Lucas. I remember that. Yeah. Oh man! Wow. Before you're avid. Wait, yeah, you're yeah, avid. that was like the precursor to avid. Was that? Wow. Yes. Which was right around Return of the Jedi, I want to say, or not Empire, really? but I think Jedi is when that became a thing. Yeah, that that's crazy. We have okay, we have to have you back on to talk about the history because because so much, and obviously, I think every creative person, whether you're new to it, you've been in it a while, or you've been in for a long time, right? I think everybody has their inspirations and things that really made them who they are today, right? It's true. And and with your entertainment background, your Hollywood, not just entertainment, but your your straight up Hollywood background, how easy of that process because I think there there comes a time in every creative person who works as a team that's a whole different thing too because I think a lot of people want to work in a team and I'm going to ask you this uh, a little in a little bit about working alone and how scary that I have be. a question I want to yeah. get with that yeah. what with me as a screenwriter I always have to think within budget. Now, so how much, how great was it? Because you said, you know, you st your hobby was short films, but when you were able to start writing, you know, when you started writing your novels and your budget was your spell check, <laughs> how much freedom was that for you? What did it feel like? First of all, your budget is your editor, your designer well, you, yeah your yeah but you know what i mean so, you can't yeah. like when, when you're writing your novel you can set it any time and place you want when you're you're able to really go anywhere you want creatively well, you don't gotta worry about man how am i gonna film this it's just get it on AI, the page with ai and george lucas again who yeah. had no sets 
yeah. and puts all the background in. That's a lot yeah. easier now. Yeah. But, um, I still kind of write with this, the the uh, use multiple scenes anyway, <laughs> multiple yeah. locations within my books, somewhat out of habit, somewhat out of if I think this one is a very good book to go to film. Um, you know, if uh, so, I know that when I'm in my head, I'm still you know film oriented. But okay. it is, it is you know I would say for sci-fi writers, it's much more you know. Of uh, uh, wow, I can put it anywhere. Yeah. My books, this is a, a book from you know today could be shot anywhere. My first book is like um, the mummy, but in Sudan, and you know, but no mummies running around. Um, <laughs> uh, I worked on that project, um, the original one. But nice. um, yeah, so it's you know it it doesn't really fall into line until you go to I've written the screenplay for this book. And that's where you start pulling together, making sure, okay, have I used that location enough time for, you know, a full day's film? You know, what, you yeah. know, so I think you start thinking that way when you pull, take the book and you put it into a, a yeah. screenplay. Yeah. 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 Um, as, as, uh, as a writer, cause, cause it is true in Hollywood, there's so many, I don't want to call them cooks in a kitchen, but it is a cook in a kitchen. And, yeah. and coming from that to working on your own and I think new, new creatives, whether you're a musician, whether you're obviously a writer, you know, any, any, anything where you can just be you picking up, say your phone or a camera or a computer to type or a guitar just to play. What, what was that like for you coming from that, that Hollywood background and going into it? knowing that you're going to be like, oh, I'm working alone. Yeah. Or yeah. what was that like? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the same thing when I was doing my own short films and things, you know, uh, the main thing for me, I mean, working alone it doesn't bother me. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. I mean, having control of your creative process is somewhat awesome. Um it's the unknown when you publish the book or you put the film out. My first film was about a female vigilante. I had no idea. I thought the audience would have figured it out prior to the ending. But when the ending hit and everybody in the audience, because I was there, went, oh, it's her? Yeah, I was like, oh, wait, I did a good job. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. you, know, you don't know until it comes out. So when people read this and come back and say, I love your book, you're like, oh, thank gosh, because uh -huh. you wonder yourself, Right, you wonder yourself when you're writing. Yeah, is this good enough? Are people going to get it? Are they going to relate to it? You know, so yeah. Yeah. that is, you know, you don't know till somebody else picks it up, reads it. Someone you don't even know who's unbiased. Right, yeah. right, right. What you. about you, Eric? Because I know you. Obviously, you write. And yeah, what was that? What was that like for you? It's so like in film school, you know, was when most of my stuff was seen. It was always a fear, like are people going to laugh at this joke? And then when they do, it's the most amazing feeling because it's not just funny to you. Right, and right. what the screenplay is like with Hillsborough Road, when all the actors talked about how much they loved the script and couldn't put it down, it was like, man, I did something right. And when people got the influences, even before I said, it was like, you know, this feels like dazed and confused and Friday the 13th. It was like, <laughs> okay, I did a good job. Yeah. I did a good job. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Actually, speaking of influences, Kay, do you have any influences that, that you could point to? Um, both as a as a as a, a filmmaker and as a writer. Yes, I have three. Um uh, Lou Wasserman was extremely innovative if you know about him and how he changed the agreements to back end deals yeah jeffrey katzenberg is a big uh proponent also of innovation on uh, being able to make animated films better more realistic and faster mm -hmm. and then my first love the, the, the reason i got into film is robert redford wow. when i saw a uh, bilingual war, war b war which is a short version of that title um, I was amazed at the cinematography, the storytelling, and he's been my mentor ever since. Wow. If he's doing anything, I watch it. Dark Winds on right now. If you watch that show, better than Yellowstone. 
don't tell the boss man. But yeah, <laughs> so yeah, it, it, you know, so I've always followed his career, worked on things, was inspired by what he was doing. Wow. Yeah. Wow. How, how now, now this is going back. How did you get to work with Lou Wasserman? Um, <laughs> I got a job there. I, <laughs> um, my, my father-in-law at the time, he's passed away now, um, knew Lou Wasserman, knew Ronald Reagan, who knew, you know, obviously, wow. knew, right, as his agent. <laughs> Lou Wasserman was his agent. And when wow. I went there, I was told I had a job. <laughs> and I showed up, and I didn't know what it was. Wow, that's amazing. Actually, I was just I was just reading and and obviously everybody that's like any anywhere near the entertainment sphere is well aware about the strikes and stuff. But yes. but Lou Wasserman and and Ronald Reagan at the time back yeah. in I think it was the 60s, right? When both the WGA and SAG were yeah. were both on strike. They had a really big hand in those those negotiations. Um, yeah, it was and, a different time. Yeah, oh, it was, but you know what? And that was right around because it was like TV had just started, mm -hmm. and the residuals, and they they that's what they were striking for, much like what they're striking for now. Yeah, and and yeah. things, and and I know that that with you being in the academy, how does and and you don't have to answer this if this is too too sticky or in the woods, but um how do how do you guys look at it and i you probably have to be neutral but well i don't know how the television academy as a group looks at it i can yeah. speak for myself yes go and look up the top five executives in hollywood take their bonuses and you can pay for everything that the striking members want just the exactly. top five. i'm yeah. not even talking about the rest of the executive at the studios right, so right. you're getting 220 million dollars as a bonus something's really wrong when yeah. the people who work for you can't even make a minimum wage and the yeah. fact that they want to start treating you know staff writers for shows as a gig type of a thing where there's no i think they want no contracts or something which is is that part of it because i know that they don't want to treat them like the way they've been treated they want to change the whole thing and that's well, awful yeah well streaming you know they don't get anything from the streaming yeah so it's hard major like they you know may, might not have for television correct yeah yeah i mean and, and... Admit, i have all the streaming services i'm the only person in the world that has shutter which is the horror <laughs> streaming service and the hallmark channel streaming <laughs> service but Interesting I, combination. Yes, yes. I miss <laughs> the days of network television and, you know, multi camera sitcoms and yeah. stuff like that. And studios, I really feel, are hurting themselves by not going back to that because you can take your actors from that sitcom and then slide them into your movies and there's already a base of people that are going to go see it like with scream most a lot of people who went to see that went to see it because oh the girl from that show oh the girl from friends is in it and yeah, but you're talking about now right yeah because now it's a past, television was seen as a lower cast right. exactly and, you know and you didn't have a Kevin Cosner going from films to exactly, television yeah. or, you know, there's other actors who do that. And then that Breaking Bad okay. and all these prestige television shows, which are better than a lot of movies coming out. Absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I just think that I, I, I would hope that, and I think the way to do it and I may be wrong is everybody just stop paying for stuff. Because if they're not putting out like all these subscription services, stop paying for them, then that's that's what will bring these people back to the the table. And I did read in Variety, I think a couple of days ago, where those where Iger and Zasloff and uh, the Netflix guy, they were all getting together with the WGA to talk. And I think once it kind of unfolds with the WGA, I think it will kind of unfold with SAG. But 
I, I, I think, you know, <laughs> much like what we were talking about at the top of the show is for all the, all the fear and the hurt and the harm that it's that, that may seem like it's doing now. I think the best outcome will, will be, you know, good for, they're always going to get money, but, but the best outcome is for the actor because, you know, and, and the filmmaker and the writer, because those are people, I, those are hearts. Those are the heart of, of anything, anything creative. You can't right. do AI. And AI still, just doesn't do it justice. Well, you know, a lot of agreements read, you know, we have the rights in this in current, media formats and anything developed in the future in perpetuity that you know that those words right there just mess up yeah uh, you, you, know. you you can't you can't because one because once you set a precedence you can't go back they're right, not yeah. going to look back so it's 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 a mess right now but i just know that i mean you look at 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 the sixties, Ronald Reagan and, and Lou Wasserman and those strikes and what they did for the TV. Right. And everything right. is, I think the same thing's going to happen. And the outcome is going to be for the best for the creative, because that's what it comes down to. So to get back into, you know, the whole novel, all the novel stuff, we know your film inspirations, but when it comes to novels, who are authors that inspire you? Oh, um, I love the Jack Ryan series. Those are great. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love those kind of books. Clancy, I read also. Um, not so much the books that I write. <laughs> really? Not your <laughs> genre that you write in? Wow. I mean, the, the, the genre being fiction is correct, but the um, I don't get into the naval things and the, you know, uh, I have one that is a murder mystery, but it's, it's, um, it's you know my characters are strong female characters which you know in hollywood is just starting to change yeah. because women are creating their own production companies yeah i had scripts i turned in they love the scripts but sorry it's a lead female character it won't sell mm -hmm. so um yeah so i have strong relationships in my books i have strong female characters strong male characters they have flaws we all have flaws doesn't make you weak yeah. and um and I'm able to bring forward my characters that way where I was stopped in Hollywood. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you could, you could probably write a book just on your life in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A million little stories. Yes. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, My goodness. Oh, Kay. Okay. Do you, could you read an excerpt from your book? Okay. Let's see. Perfect, perfect. Can't wait to hear it. Yes. Okay, I'll do the start of the book. How's that sound? That sounds, sounds awesome. great. Then y'all go, oh, I need to know the rest. <laughs> uh, that's right. That's what it should do. Absolutely. Okay. Let me know when you want me to stop. Or I'll probably stop about... Yeah. Okay. okay. Sitting in the sanctuary, his living room, Ken wonders why he's still living when ending it all sounds a much better option. Life has not shown mercy on him. The scars on his body would never trade, but the scar in his heart is killing him and not fast enough. Ken takes refuge in his Chicago home by spending evenings in front of the TV stretched out on his old chestnut brown leather lounge chair. This is where he spends most of his time in the house when he's not at work. There are the nights he naps there if he falls asleep at all. Most nights he spends restless, wondering what he could have done differently to protect his family. His sleeplessness over the last couple of nights is the price he pays for his sorrow. Two nights earlier, the living room lamp light blue. Being too lazy to fix it, Ken started sitting in the dark once nightfall hits. The only ambient light glows from the street light in the front of the house next door. This particular night, he's sitting in front of the TV with the volume down low. He's pressed into his brown leather lounger, transfixed into space as he runs memories of his wife and child through his mind. The memories are pleasant. Grief 
is his daily companion, purgatory he holds on to as he shuffles through the family photos. Holding on an old photo of his wife and son, he memorizes every detail of the face for fear of forgetting. He prefers to review the photos as the images are like statues, allowing Ken to take in every detail. Much has not changed from that day. He has not taken the time to go through anything in the house, as if time was frozen between the walls while the world goes on without him. His child's room remains untouched after all this time. Many of his wife's personal effects are still around. Then suddenly he hears a loud crash. Boom! Ken immediately leaps from his chair, grabs his handgun from the side table and heads towards the back kitchen door, leaving the lights off. He could easily see within the house as his eyes were already attuned to using the streetlight beams in front, coming in through his side windows to guide him. Turning on the light would only warn the intruders. He knows he will keep the intruders out as he listens to the repeated kicks against his door. Suddenly, the wooden door slams open. A huge clatter came as he witnessed the kitchen door crashing. Stop right there, he yells. The taller of the two figures swings around and fires a shot off, missing Ken completely. Ken fires back, hitting the intruder on the right side of his chest. Then the taller silhouette hits the ground as a second smaller one takes cover, crouching next to the bottom of the kitchen cabinets and extending his hand in a futile attempt to stop any bullets from coming his way. Don't move or I'll shoot, Ken orders. Wait, that that's the stopping point? <laughs> okay. I'm Are hooked. I, aren't I horrible? <laughs> yes. I'm hooked. That's amazing. Wow. I and I tell you what, it is. I can tell you. I okay, so I'm a visual reader and I'm a visual listener, as it turns out. Same. <laughs> but when but you I, film, yeah. But exactly. And which is a great, great, because you could tell, you could tell you've got the the filmmaking background. Exactly. Um, It was very cinematic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and the way that that you brought us in and you really hooked in and and I and now I'm very intrigued um, about 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 Ken and what has happened and how he's going to move forward. Because it's because, you know, honestly, it is hard when you're down in the and when you're in the thick of it and and just to even think about how did you come up with that? I mean, did you have you gone through stuff like this before? It's amazing the way you wrote this and you just get a little bit. How in the world? (laughs) Um, Thank you very much. Um. You you put some of yourself into every book you write and every character you write. Um, have I ever been depressed? Absolutely. I don't know who hasn't, but um, has well actually yeah someone has tried to break into my house, but um, <laughs> while I was in it and the TV oh, was low, so oh um, yeah. Now that I think about it, but um, yeah. So you you know as you're writing and creating and you're thinking you know you're right. I'm a visual. I'm very visual. I put in things that people don't expect. Humor pops up when you least expect it. You think something tragic's happening and then all of a sudden you're like, what? Uh-huh. Um, and I love doing that. That's a little bit of Spielberg there, right? Cause he likes, Spielberg likes you to scream and then laugh and then scream. Right. So um, yeah, so I throw that into my books as well. So you you do write some of what you've experienced, you enhance it, you know, you yeah. make it. It was my first lead male character, not my first uh, male character. Yeah. So I made sure to have a male editor and asked him to make sure, you know, that I'm writing, you know, yeah. things that male, a man would say or do. Yeah. That, but he came I, back and said I did fine. So Wow. That's pretty interesting. Let me ask you this <laughs> crazy question. When you were writing this, did you cry? Who did you make question. yourself cry? No, actually, I I don't think I did. I'm writing too fast. I'm writing what's next. Yeah, but I will true. tell you. When you finish the book, I felt like, oh, there goes Ken. Ken's Aww. happy. Things are great. It's very uplifting at the end. But um, it, you know, you just kind of go like, okay, bye bye, Ken. You know, right. it's like the sequel. Yeah. 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 Cause so and, I, and I have a loss for my characters when I don't, I'm not planning on doing another book. 
Right, right. And I, I think that's I think that's kind of worth maybe just talking about for a minute is it is. I mean, you live with things for so long. Yeah. And and it's almost like they become you and you become them in a way. And what I mean, what was that like? Like that separation. That's so weird. That... I think that's why I jump into another book so quickly. Right. You know, like yeah. the puppy dies, you go buy another puppy. Here's yeah. a little trivia. All my main characters start with the letter K. Interesting. Oh. K oh. The letter K. <laughs> That's why his name's Ken. So, yeah. Wow. I love All it. All of my books, the lead characters' names start with K. Nice. I like nice. that. Can Can you make me a, a, a carry in one of your books? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be K-A-R-R-I-E, right? Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Oh my gosh. K, you are absolutely you are so much fun to talk to. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, we're 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 blessed and better off today than than we'd start talking to you. So thank right. you. You're welcome. You're my welcome. Gosh. Anytime. Yeah. Be back yes. anytime you want to talk more about. Hollywood and how it's changed. <laughs> that would be great. The, the 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 sound in your voice, you're like, ah, yeah, let's talk about Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and how it's changed. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's it's changed a lot. It's changed yeah. for, some for the better, some for maybe for not so better. I think there's an absolute uh I do know that, you know, with everything, there is an evolution, and I think you have to somehow you have to respect the evolution of where we came to respect mm -hmm. and even look at to where we're headed, not only as people, but in, in the creative community in general, I think. You know, stop and think that Edison turned on the lights at Universal Studios. Oh, That's God. Right. Yeah. So it really hasn't been all that long on how far we've come. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Kate, you really are an inspiration. I, 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 I love talking to you because I love talking and, and listening to just a little bit about, you know, like old, older Hollywood. And I just I that it's really cool. You really yeah, I have talked to you about Charlie Chaplin and how it took him only two weeks to make his film, how he wrote, write, sang music. I love it all. That's awesome. OK. Uh, I'm checking our calendar right now about getting you back on to absolutely talk because for sure, for sure. that, 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 how do you feel about like your work and stuff? Because I know, I know some people like look back. Cause I like, I, me and Eric met in, in like Los Angeles and, and I did the acting things for yeah. about 10 years and in commercials and like independent film and stuff. I look back on it very fondly because i'm i'm able to look back and go this is what i learned about not only the business but really who i am as a person right and right. and and i'm okay with that i'm i'm a little probably weird anyway cuz you know like in la everything everybody's so open and free and when you move away to you know you come back to texas and stuff right everybody's <laughs> yeah. everybody's kind of like man why are you so happy all the time why are <laughs> you so why are you so not yeah. you know like everybody else but and but i i think there there comes a point when you are able to look back and go you know that was that was kind of cool that was kind of a, a good time no it was a good time like when i went into hollywood i did everything i wanted you know, been to award shows, walk the red carpet, That's you know, awesome. met people, or whatever. Uh, gained a very thick skin. Um, yeah. You know, someone once coached me on, I was afraid I would have to change to fit into Hollywood. And they, and this Moy Paxton, if you know who he was, he's yeah. passed. Um, said, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to do this, this, and this. Know that some people will get promoted faster because they're doing it, but know that you know when you put your head on the pillow, you feel good about you. Yeah. And so, I enjoyed Hollywood. I, I, <laughs> for the good or the bad of it, I like to point that out. Yeah. Am not impressed yeah. by someone because they're on a big screen. So yeah. that can be good. That can be bad. Mm -hmm. I don't fall yeah. at their feet. They're just yeah. like everybody else. And um, if, if they are someone who is grounded, a Michael J. Fox, 
yeah. that doesn't bother them at all. Mm -hmm. So you you end up making very good friends uh, in Hollywood um, because a lot of things are open. A lot of things, you know, you're doing things on a set that you won't do at any other job anywhere else ever. Anymore. <laughs> and um, yeah, you you know you kind of get to know people intimately on a different scale yeah, in Hollywood yeah. than you do at a regular nine to five. But right. that was you know in Mexico or whatever. Yeah, um, completely different scenario. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, being on the being on a set and working when we shot our horror film here in Austin, and um, I mean, it's and you know, anytime you could be on a, a commercial set for 12 hours you could be on a movie set for six months three months two weeks and still have that same kind of like that's the intense connection that that you gain you know when you're able to to look at somebody and you're friends with them and you look at them and go man what the hell are we doing let's get going and you can kind of yell at each other and piss oh. each other off and then the next day go, Hey man, what's up? How you doing? Good morning. Blah, fine. blah, blah. Yeah. Everything's fine. And we're everybody. Cause it's such an intense emotion. Everybody's at each other. Cause they want to do so good. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And, and during the thing, you're like, I'm never going to effing do this anymore. This sucks. <laughs> and yeah. then you finish it and you're like, you can't wait to do it again. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, when you were talking about the strike and all the hostilities going back and forth, I was actually going to mention in Hollywood, as soon as they resolve it, that's all gone. So it's exactly. Exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah exactly. You act like exactly. it never happened because exactly. you're going to be sitting across or next to that person within the end of the year. Right, yeah. right. Exactly. Signing a movie deal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's a weird business and you you become accustomed to just going you just go with the flow. You just yeah, go with the that flow. Thing David Letterman said, there's no business like show business, but there's a lot like accounting. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, God bless. Okay. No, just, for real. We are going to have you back on. Yes. Yeah. We just want to um, thank you so yeah. much for coming on. And like we said, all of Kay's links will be in the description. If you're listening in on Anchor, and when the episode goes up, we will link her in all of our social media. <laughs> Kay, once again, thank you so much for coming on the show. And like we say each and every week, remember everybody, support our troops.